Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Professor John Williams. I'm the Dean of the Adelaide Law School. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the James Crawford Biennial Lecture Series on International Law. I'd like to welcome and acknowledge uh, tonight the presence of the Vice-Chancellor and, and President Professor Warren Bebbington, uh, the Honourable uh, John Von Duser, former Chancellor of the University, uh, members of the Judiciary, the Solicitor General, uh, Professor Crawford and the Crawford family, uh, colleagues and friends, and especially our alumni and friend in Malaysia who are joining us here today. And obviously, finally, I'd like to welcome our distinguished speakers, Professor Anne Orford and Dr Emily Crawford. As is the tradition at the University of Adelaide, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Ghana people, the traditional owners upon which the three ca campuses of the university are built. Uh, I pay my respects to their elders and the continuing strong cultural links that they bring to the university. And prior to the, uh, the oration, uh, the university would like to make a special presentation to Professor Crawford. The 2012 Distinguished Alumni Award, as the name suggests, recognises outstanding achievement by one of our alumni. I, can I ask the Vice-Chancellor and Professor Crawford to come forward and I'd like to read the citation for this award. So the citation reads, James Crawford graduated from the University of Adelaide with a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Laws honours in 1972. Today he is arguably the world's leading international lawyer and one of the most distinguished lawyers of his generation. Following his degree at the University of Adelaide, he undertook a postgraduate study at Oxford where he completed a doctoral studies on the creation of states in international law. Returning to Adelaide in 1974, he took up the position at the Adelaide Law School and was awarded a personal chair in 1982. He was appointed to the Australian Law Reform Commission in that same year and worked on various significant references. He was the commissioner in charge for the recognition of Aboriginal customary law, which remains one of the groundbreaking works in the area. In 1986, Professor Crawford was appointed to the prestigious Chalice Chair of International Law at the University of Sydney, and he served as Dean of the Faculty from 1990 to 1992. In 1992, he took up the Huell chair, chair at uh, Cambridge and in the same year was elected to the United Nations International Law Commission. He served as the Special Rapporteur for the State Responsibility from 2007 to 2001. He was responsible for the International Law Commission's draft statute on the International Criminal Court and he was elected a Fellow of the British Academy in 2000. At Cambridge, uh, Professor Crawford was the director of the Ludipac Centre for International Law between 97 and 2003 and again from 2006 to 2010. Professor Crawford has been recognised for his academic achievements with a Doctor of Laws from Cambridge in 2003 and he holds an honorary doctorate from the Paris Pontion uh, Sabon and the Pasmane Peter Catholic University in Budapest. In 2012 he was awarded the prestigious American Society of International Law uh, Manley O. Hudson Medal. As well as an outstanding academic career, Professor Crawford is equally accomplished as a practicing lawyer. Professor Crawford has appeared in significant cases before the, a number of international tribunals, including the International Court of Justice and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Currently, Professor Crawford is the Huell Professor of International Law at the University of Cambridge. Vice-Chancellor, I present to you Professor James Crawford SC, a fit and proper recipient of a Distinguished Alumni Award in recognition for his leadership and outstanding contribution to the field of international law. <laughs> Professor Crawford. I was asked to say a few words. I came here to listen to my daughter not, and, of course, to Professor Orford, <laughs> and not to speak. But one thing that one of the students said to me uh, while we were walking down made me think one thing that I do want to say. Um, international law sounds interesting at a distance. When you get close to it, uh, it is still interesting, but also it has its problems. All sorts of areas of law have their problems, and law is, in a certain sense, connected. 
If you want to be an international lawyer, be a lawyer first. Be a good lawyer and then see what happens. Anything can happen from Adelaide and it does. It's a wonderful university. It was a wonderful law school when I was there and it still is. So I'm speaking now to the undergraduate students. Do your best and see what happens. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to invite uh, Associate Professor Dale Stevens to do some introductions. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, John. Um, it's my very great privilege uh, to um, be invited to present, or to present, to, uh, I'm not presenting anything. I'm actually just uh, uh, introducing our guest speaker. Um, I met uh, Anne Orford in 2008 for the first time. Uh, we had invited uh, Professor David Kennedy from Harvard Law School to come to Australia to assist us in the, I was in the Navy at the time, assist us with, with military, military decision making and the law. And when he arrived, uh, there were a number of requests from a number of universities, including our own, and including Melbourne University, that David should, uh, could he come and speak to them. So we went to Melbourne University, uh, David Kennedy, uh, myself and a few other military people, and uh, went to their very lavish uh, boardroom at uh, the law school uh, where I first met Anne. It was a crowded uh, boardroom. Um, there were many, many students, postgrads, faculty members, and David and Anne at the table. And I remember the, the conversation began with, with questions and answers, and it was all going according to, to script. Um, and then uh, Anne asked her first question. And it was very clear that uh, she was something very special. She had an insight and a perspective on international law that, that was uh, unique and novel. And David responded um, and kind of upped the ante. And Anne responded to David and, and upped the ante and, and so on and so forth. And this went on for a few minutes. And we all just faded off into the background and were quite happy uh, in doing that. It was quite evident, to, to me at least, that I was observing two masters at work um, a Jim Morrison and a Janis Joplin, if you like. Um, Bjorn Borg, Chris Evert, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe or Pablo Picasso. Pick your analogy, but that's what we were observing. Around about the stratosphere, um, Anne or David, one of them kind of blinked and, and came back to reality and invited anybody else to, to engage. We all sighed a, a, a sigh of actually despair because we were rather enjoying uh, where we were going and I honestly felt that we were going to get the answer to the meaning of life uh, in the <laughs> course of that exchange. But it is my great honour to introduce Anne and, and let me now um, speak to that. Anne Orford is the Michael uh, D. Kirby Chair of International Law uh, and an Australian Research Council Future Fellow at Melbourne Law School. Her publica publications include International Authority and Responsibility to Protect, Reading International Humanitarian Intervention and um, and the edited collection, International Law and its Others. Anne is the President of the Australian and New Zealand Society of International Law and was the founding director of the Institute for International Law and, and the Humanities at Melbourne Law School. She has been a visiting professor at the Sorbonne Law School and uh, Lund University, a research fellow at NYU and a core faculty member at the Harvard Global Law and Economic Policy Workshop. She's a graduate of the Universities of Queensland, London, and Adelaide, where she completed her PhD, and holds the degree of Doctor of Laws Honours Causa from Lund University and the University of Goth Gothenburg. Since 2001, she has provided briefings to governments on the responsibility to protect uh, concept, the subject of, our, of her talk today, uh, in relation to the Arab Spring, and has presented her work on these issues in Australia, Canada, Finland, France, Germany, Hong Kong, India, Japan, Sweden, the UK, and the US. May I ask uh, Anne to please come up and present. Thank you. So many thanks for that, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I've never before been uh, compared to Dennis Joplin. <laughs> and I will, uh, I'm sorry, I will hold that very dear to my heart. Uh, so, I would like to, uh, first of all, thank the University of Adelaide Law School and uh, particularly the Dean, John Williams, and my host, Dale Stevens, for inviting me to present the James Crawford Lecture on International Law for 2013. 
It's wonderful to be back at Adelaide Law School. This is, of course, a law school with a proud tradition in international law, and it's exciting to see this tradition being carried on by the dynamic group of international lawyers now on faculty, many of them seated in the front row, among them Dale Stevens, Rebecca LaForgia, Matthew Stubbs, and also uh, Judith Gardam, who couldn't be here tonight, but who was uh, one of my doctoral supervisors, along with Hilary Charlesworth in what I'll now call the last century. So uh, it's a particular privilege and a pleasure to have been asked to present a lecture named in honour of James Crawford. Professor Crawford has been an inspiration and a mentor to my generation of Australian international lawyers. As you've heard, he is widely regarded as one of the most distinguished scholars, publicists, teachers and practitioners of international law in the modern era. But perhaps more importantly, he's a role model for the way that he manages to carry all his achievements and accomplishments with lightness, humour, grace, and an enviable uh, aura of uh, calm, as Rebecca and I were commenting earlier. On a personal note, I've benefited greatly from his wise counsel and his support over the years. And it's also wonderful that Dr. Emily Crawford is able to be here tonight to offer her comments on the lecture. So many of you will be very familiar with the two concepts that make up the title of tonight's talk, and if you weren't before, uh, you will be after the past few weeks of discussion. So humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect have both been invoked over the past two years, indeed over the past two weeks, to shape interpretations of, the, of uh, international responses to actions unfolding uh, first in Libya and now in Syria. Tonight I want to explore the place of these concepts within international law and to ask whether their adoption by members of the international community has been a good thing or a bad thing in terms of the specific goal of protecting populations. In order to explore these questions, my talk tonight will do three things. First, I'll begin by considering the relationship between humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect concept. Now, those concepts are often referred to as if they were interchangeable, but in fact the responsibility to protect concept emerged in response to deep concerns about uh, the embrace of humanitarian intervention during the 1990s. Second, I'll explore the response that states have had to the responsibility to protect concept as it's been refined over the past decade. And third, I'll analyse the normative significance of the responsibility to protect concept. And I'll focus uh, in particular on the ways in which it's transformed our understanding of humanitarian crises in the Middle East since 2011 and shaped interpretations of the acts legally available to external uh, actors in responding to those crises. So first, the emergence of the concept of responsibility to protect. In order to understand or to grasp the significance of that concept, I think it's necessary to remember the context of debates about the legality of humanitarian intervention, which formed the backdrop to the emergence of that concept at the beginning of the 21st century. So the 1990s, um, some of you will remember and some of you will have been told, uh, saw a major shift in internationalist approaches to the legitimacy of humanitarian intervention. During the Cold War, the claim that international actors might resort to force to protect human rights and democracy on the part of the West or self-determination on the part of the Soviets had received little support in international law. Humanitarian intervention had played a limited role both in official justifications for the use of force and indeed in scholarly commentary. Under the UN Charter, member states had undertaken to refrain in their international relations from the th threat or use of force except in self-defence or where authorised by the Security Council. General Assembly resolutions adopted during the Cold War unambiguously outlawed forcible intervention. And states themselves largely did not justify their resort to force on humanitarian grounds. This was not because leaders at the time lacked a sense of justice, but because they considered the prohibition on unilateral intervention in the UN Charter 
to be itself a moral commitment. <coughs> Humanitarian intervention was not a doctrine that states wanted to champion in the post-colonial era because it was perceived to be capable of abuse. However, during the 1990s, the idea that Western states might have the right to use force in defence of human rights or democracy began to gain some traction. And this really came to a head with the 1999 NATO intervention in Kosovo without Security Council authorisation, an action which formed the immediate trigger for the development of the responsibility to protect concept and which has been invoked repeatedly over the past two weeks as a desirable precedent for international intervention in Syria. The NATO intervention exposed the fault lines that divided world opinion on the question of the legality of humanitarian intervention. Many states and commentators saw the Kosovo intervention as illegitimate and ineffective and were strongly critical of the way in which NATO allies conducted the operation. But other states and commentators saw the intervention as Ill illegal but legitimate, arguing that there were strong moral or humanitarian justifications for the action. And they asked, if the UN fails to make the right decisions and fails in its duty to protect populations at risk effectively, what's wrong with coalitions of the willing, powerful states or regional organisations taking its place, particularly if they can do so more effectively or represent universal values more faithfully. So the NATO intervention was not only a challenge for the sovereign state, but it was also a challenge for the UN and it was certainly perceived that way by the then UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. In a challenge to the UN General Assembly, Annan said, if the collective conscience of humanity cannot find in the United Nations its greatest tribune, there is a grave danger that it will look elsewhere for peace and for justice. So that was the context out of which the responsibility to protect concept emerged. How then does it differ from humanitarian intervention and how have states responded to the development of this new concept? So in response to the challenge posed by Kofi Annan, the Canadian government announced at the General Assembly in 2000 its establishment of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, or ISIS, tasked with producing a report on the issues involved in debates about intervention. The subsequent ISIS report, now famously uh, entitled The Responsibility to Protect, sought to transcend the perceived tension between sovereignty and humanitarian intervention manifested in the debates about Kosovo. In order to find a way of m moving beyond what they called the intervention dilemma, the report's authors argued that the changing international environment required a necessary recharacterization of sovereignty from sovereignty as control to sovereignty as responsibility. And here they are, work, are building on the work of Francis Deng and his co-authors. Francis Deng had been special rapporteur on uh, internally displaced people uh, for the UN. He's now the uh, U, uh, special advisor on genocide. So according to ISIS, state authorities are responsible for functions, the functions of protecting the safety and lives of citizens and promoting their welfare. But if a state proves unable or unwilling or incapable of fulfilling those functions and uh, meeting this responsibility to protect, then that responsibility and those functions fall to the broader community <coughs> of states. And the report set out, a, set out a broad range of techniques well beyond uh, the use of force that were available to meet this international responsibility to protect. According to the report's earth authors, amongst them uh, Gareth Evans, the responsibility to protect encompasses a responsibility <coughs> to prevent conflict, a responsibility to react to conflict, and a responsibility to rebuild after conflict. That sounds like a set of temporal uh, descriptions, but in fact I think this is better understood as a grouping of ways, uh, groups of techniques. Techniques for prevention, such as surveillance, early warning, uh, provision of development assistance, techniques for reaction, such as use of force, techniques for rebuilding, such as administration and security sector reform. <coughs> 
Now, in, in the intervening period, in, in fact, uh, the, this is, of course, the anniversary uh, of, the, of the release of this report, of the writing of this report, was September 11, 2001. So the report was shelved until the end of that year uh, when it was published. It didn't seem a good time for a report even thinking about uh, new uh, reasons for intervention, and it looked like it might um, sink. But um, over the intervening uh, few years, uh, a lot of work was put in, particularly by the uh, Canadian government, in promoting this notion. Uh, and the responsibility to protect then came of age, I think, with its uh, unanimous adoption uh, by the General Assembly in 2005 uh, in the World Summit Outcome, adopted by heads of state and governments. And in that meeting and in that document, the General Assembly endorsed the notion that both the state and the international community have a responsibility to protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity, and adopted a broad vision, again uh, far, beyond humanitarian, uh, far beyond military intervention, of the kinds of techniques that might be authorised as an exercise of that responsibility. Yet despite the inclusion of the concept in the World Summit outcome, it wasn't immediately clear that states and international organisations would uh, take it up institutionally or operationally. And in particular, reports began to circulate of a growing unease about the concept, particularly amongst members of the non-aligned movement, concerned that the responsibility to protect might be used to justify unilateral intervention. So in response, the Secretary General's very uh, energetic special advisor on the responsibility to protect, Ed Luck, together with an informal governmental grouping of Friends of the Responsibility to Protect and a broad coalition of civil society groups, engaged in a concerted program of negotiation and discussion with states in the lead up to a General Assembly meeting scheduled to discuss the concept in 2009. And in January of that year, the Secretary General produced the first of what's now a series of reports for debates in the General Assembly, setting out strategies for implementing the concept, focusing upon prevention, early warning mechanisms, capacity building and assistance to states before humanitarian crises break out. So at the subsequent General Assembly meeting on the concept held in July 2009, 94 representatives spoke, I think that's a world record for a, a meeting of the General Assembly, revealing wide support for the Secretary General's approach to implementing the responsibility to protect concept. While many representatives made crystal clear their determination that the concept must not be misused by powerful states to justify unilateral humanitarian intervention, most were willing to endorse the use of the responsibility to protect concept to justify the expansion of softer forms of international engagement. So that was the high point of the consensus around the responsibility to protect concept. And this all changed in February 2011. That was when the responsibility to protect concept moved into a new phase with its invocation in Security Council resolutions 1970 and 1973, dealing with Libya. So resolution 1970 was adopted unanimously under Chapter 7 on the 26th of February 2011. It referred to the Libyan authorities' responsibility to protect its population, imposed an arms embargo and other restrictions on travel and Libyan assets, and referred the situation in Libya to the International Criminal Court. And on the 27th of March 2011, the Security Council passed Resolution 1973, authorising member states acting in cooperation with the Secretary General to take all necessary measures to protect civilians and civilian populated areas, so that's a very broad uh, protection, under threat of attack in Libya. The resolution also demanded the immediate establishment of a ceasefire and a complete end to violence and banned all flights in Libyan airspace unless their sole purpose was humanitarian. As the NATO intervention undertaken pursuant to that resolution progressed during 2011, however, the uneasy consensus around the responsibility to protect concept began to unravel. <coughs> 
So what then is the normative significance of the responsibility to protect concept in 2013? I'm going to address that question by referring particularly to the ways in which the concept has shaped the legal interpretation of humanitarian crises in the Middle East over the past two years. What does the concept, well, who does the concept constrain and who does it empower? How, if at all, has the responsibility to protect concept transformed international law? And how might international law transform the responsibility to protect concept? So I want to um, make four points then, the remainder of the lecture, thinking about these questions of normative significance. So first, the responsibility to protect concept represents a shift in the way that authority is understood. This represents a significant departure from the conception of authority that has formed the normative basis of the modern international legal system since 1945. So the creation of the UN in 1945 saw the emergence of an international regime in which the principles of self-determination, sovereign equality and the prohibition against acquisition uh, of territory through the use of force were treated alongside effective control over territory as central to determining the lawfulness of particular claimants to authority. So as James Crawford has written in his book on the creation of states in international law, under the UN Charter, the lawfulness of authority over a given territory was thus a matter both of fact, effective control, and of right, issues of self-determination, issues of relationship to a people. The responsibility to protect concept shifts somewhat the emphasis in these debates about authority back to a question of fact. The responsibility to protect concept treats the lawfulness or the legitimacy of authority, both local and international, as flowing from the factual capacity and willingness to protect the inhabitants of a territory. This argument for the lawfulness of authority does not prioritise self-determination, popular sovereignty or other romantic or nationalist bases for determining who should have the power to govern in a particular territory. Rather, the authority to govern is grounded on the capacity to protect. Thus, the responsibility to protect concept shifts the foundations of authority towards a factual question. Which claimant to authority can effectively guarantee protection to the inhabitants of a territory? Now, the claim that authority to be lawful must be capable of securing the protection of the people is potentially a radical one. It can be used to challenge existing regimes or existing authorities and to champion new regimes or claimants to authority. Yet the effect of that radicalisation of authority and the possible uh, militarisation of civil life that often accompanies it is not predetermined. The implications of this are illustrated, I think, by events in the Middle East where many different political and military projects have been justified in terms of protecting civilians. So what will that mean for the security and welfare of people in the Middle East? I think that depends upon a further set of questions, so the next three points that I want to talk about. First, who gets to decide when populations are at risk and what is needed to protect them? Second, how will such decisions be made? And third, what limits will be placed upon those doing the protecting? Let me consider how the responsibility to protect concept addresses each of these questions in turn. First, who decides? Who decides whether a state can in fact protect its population and what is needed to guarantee protection? So as lawyers know, questions of fact are complex things. It matters who decides questions of fact. Who decides whether a situation is one in which populations are at risk? Who decides whether particular conduct is a legitimate attempt to secure a territory or an Ill illegitimate attack on civilians? Who decides how protection can pe best be realised in a particular time and place? And who decides which claimant to authority is best able to provide protection? The World Summit outcome and subsequent reports of the Secretary General have sought to provide clear answers to that jurisdictional question of who decides. 
In the lead up to the World Summit, many states were concerned at the potential expansion of international authority that could flow from formal endorsement of the responsibility to protect concept by the General Assembly. As a result, the World Summit outcome is also careful to leave little scope for actors or organisations other than the UN to claim the international responsibility to protect. So in negotiating the paragraphs in the World Summit outcome on the responsibility to protect, it was essential for many states, including the members of the non-aligned movement, that this broad international responsibility was entrusted to the international community only when acting through the UN, and in the case of the use of force, acting through the Security Council. Thus, almost every reference in the outcome to actions undertaken by the international community refers to the UN. So paragraph 138 states that the international community should, as appropriate, encourage and help states to exercise the responsibility to protect and should support the United Nations in establishing an early warning capability. Paragraph 139 provides that the international community through the United Nations also has the responsibility to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian and other peaceful means in accordance with the Charter to help to protect populations. And should peaceful means be inadequate and national authorities manifestly failing to protect their populations, states agreed to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter on a case-by-case -case basis and in cooperation with relevant regional organisations as appropriate. Yet that jurisdictional delimitation and UN oversight has proved difficult to maintain. In the context of Libya, for example, it was largely NATO acting under a Security Council mandate but nonetheless a regional organisation representing the security interests of Western Europe and North America that exercised the power to make decisions during 2011 about how protection should be uh, realised in North Africa and by whom. Many UN member states have since expressed strong concern about the conduct of that operation by NATO and its interpretation of the Security Council mandate it was given under Resolution 1973. It's clear from the debates that have taken place in the Security Council and the arguments made not only by Russia, but by China, Brazil and India, that this has shaped the willingness of many states uh, to consider protection mandates in Syria. In the context of Syria, the commitment to taking collective military action through the Security Council has been undermined by the approach that has been taken to supporting and arming rebels. In quite subtle ways, the responsibility to protect concept appears to have legitimised forms of intervention just short of direct resort to force, such as the provision of non-lethal that's the words of the New York Times, and increasingly lethal aid to rebels or indeed to government forces. From the perspective of protecting populations, it seems increasingly clear that that has been a disaster. We can get a sense of that from the recent report of the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic, the fifth report presented to the Human Rights Council on 4th June 2013. I strongly recommend that report to you. I think it's one of the most important documents that's been produced to date on Syria. The report found that Syria remains engulfed in an escalating civil war and that the conflict in Syria has reached new levels of brutality, particularly on the part of the government, but also on the side of the rebels. The transfer of arms and involvement of external actors has contributed to the militarisation of the civil life of that country and to the escalation of conflict. The escalation of conflict is clear if we look at statistics. Uh, the, General uh, the Security Council debate on Syria at the beginning of 2012 reported that 7,500 people had been killed uh, in Syria over that first year between March 2011 and beginning of 2012. Recent statistical analysis of killings in the Syrian Arab Republic released by the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights in June 2013 
reports that 100,191 people have now been killed in Syria by uh, April 2013. 43,000 government forces, 18,000 rebels, and 36,661, that's very precise, civilians. The vast proportion of the people killed have been men, 82.6%. And those figures were much higher even than the report reported death toll in January 2013 of almost 60,000 people. So people are now being killed at the rate of 5,000 people per month. The civil war in Syria has also produced an alarming increase in internally displaced people and refugees. Last week, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Guterres, reported that more than 2 million Syrians have now fled the country. By the end of August, there were 716,000 Syrian refugees uh, registered with the UN in Lebanon. 515,000 in Jordan. It does put our boats a little bit to shame. 460,000 in Turkey, 168,000 in Iraq, and 110,000 in Egypt, with many more likely to be unregistered. Another 4.5 million people have been displaced within the country. That means that more than a third of the country have now been displaced. Guterres saw this as the effect of a conflict in constant escalation. I foolishly looked at some photographs of the refugee camps this morning and I knew that was a bad idea. Uh, so in their June report, the Independent Commission of Inquiry pointed to the role of external actors in escalating the civil war in Syria. They comment that military encroachments on sovereignty have opened the possibility of violence consuming the region. They say the current political impasse and military escalation are the byproduct of the regional and international standoff between the government's backers and its opponents, translating into arms consignments and political backing to both sides by their respective allies or patrons. The report points specifically to involvement by Lebanese Hezbollah, Jabhat al-Nazra's link to al-Qaeda in, in Iraq, the involvement of Jordan, Israel, the, U the EU and Russia. And we can now add uh, the US uh, since its um, announcement that it would be arming rebels in June. In the London Review of Books, Patrick Coburn has recently argued that the protracted conflict that's now underway in Syria has more in common with the civil wars in Lebanon and Iraq than with the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya. There will soon, he says, be a solid block of fragmented countries that stretches between the Mediterranean and Iran, and meanwhile foreign countries are gaining influence with the help of local proxies. To appreciate the point that I want now to make about the radical effect of the responsibility to protect concept, it's interesting to compare the lack of discussion about the legality of those funding and supporting military and paramilitary activities in and against Syria with earlier legal responses to the involvement of outside actors in situations of civil war or proxy war. The potential of the responsibility protect concept to shift radically the way external involvement in civil wars is understood can best be grasped by thinking about another legal principle we've traditionally applied in interpreting the rights and responsibilities of external actors uh, in civil or proxy wars. So that principle is the principle of non-intervention and it received its clearest legal interpretation in the 1986 decision of the International Court of Justice in the case concerning military and paramilitary measures in and against Nicaragua. A much loved case by many generations of international lawyers. I hope the undergraduates here grow to love it as well. So, uh, although I do gather that I read Stephen Schwabel saying that James doesn't think it was correctly decided on the jurisdiction point, but I'm sure he loves other parts of it. Uh, so, as Mazia Jan Majad and Michael Wood have recently written, by seeking to understand the concept of non-intervention, we can perhaps better appreciate the significance of proposals for radical change in the international system, such as the calls for a responsibility to protect, and better understand the concerns to which such proposals sometimes give rise. So the Nicaragua case, for those of you who haven't uh, enjoyed uh, studying international law, concerned the legality of US military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua, including inter alia, the recruiting, training, arming, equipping, financing, supplying, and otherwise encouraging, supporting, aiding, and directing 
military and paramilitary actions in and against Nicaragua. The case is interesting to reflect upon at present because of what it said about the principle of intervention, non-intervention, and because of its historical and geographical context. Many of the early formulations of the principle of non-intervention from the 1930s onwards emerged out of attempts to renegotiate the relation been between the US and its engagement in proxy wars with its near neighbours in Central and Southern America. During the 1960s through to the 1980s, the General Assembly was very active in developing the principle of non-intervention in numerous resolutions, including, most significantly, the Friendly Relations Declaration adopted by consensus in 1970. And the Nicaragua decision is the culmination of such attempts to think about what political independence might mean for states. The case is also of relevance to thinking about the legality of contemporary forms of involvement in proxy wars in the Middle East, because US policy in the Middle East under the former administration of George W. Bush was strongly informed by US foreign policy in El Salvador and Nicaragua during the 1980s, both in terms of strategy and in terms of personnel. Many Bush administration officials and advisers during the war against Iraq were veterans of the Reagan administration's Central American policy of the 1980s that was the subject of the Nicaragua case. So in the Nicaragua judgment, we see one legal response to a foreign policy situation that in some ways shaped today's Middle East landscape. So in that case, the ICJ famously held that the provision of financial and other assistance by the US to the armed opposition in Nicaragua, the Contras, was a breach of the principle of non-intervention. The court stated that the principle of non-intervention involves the right of every state to conduct its affairs without outside interference. For the court, the principle of non-intervention was a corollary of the principle of the sovereign equality of states enshrined as the basis of uh, UN uh, membership in Article 2.1 of the UN Charter. The court affirmed, citing its earlier decision in the Corfu Channel case, that the alleged right of intervention is, as the manifestation of a policy of force cannot find a place in international law, whatever be the present defects in international organisation. The court then asked whether there had been any change in practice illustrative of a belief in a kind of general right for states to intervene in support of an internal opposition in another state whose cause appeared particularly worthy by reason of the political and moral values with which it was a general with which it was identified and the court said for such a general right to come into existence would involve a fundamental fundamental modification of the customary law principle of non-intervention the court found that there had been no such fundamental modification the court also addressed the question of humanitarian assistance. It found that humanitarian assistance is not unlawful intervention, provided that it is non-discriminatory and has as its purpose to protect life and health and to ensure respect for the human being. However, if humanitarian assistance is directed just to one side in a civil war, it is in breach of the principle of non-intervention. So how does this compare to the current situation in Syria? Certainly, we have heard surprisingly little discussion of the position that absent Security Council authorization, support for insurgents or provision of assistance to one side in the civil war is in breach of the principle of non-intervention. It may be possible that the emergence of the responsibility to protect concept has meant the kind of fundamental modification of the customary law principle of non-intervention that the ICJ foresaw but did not find in the Nicaragua case. However, if the responsibility to protect concept has led to a fundamental modification of this principle of non-intervention, such that it's now lawful to support, train and arm rebel groups, that modified law of non-intervention must be generalisable. <coughs> Here it's important to remember the link made with uh, the principle of sovereign equality. So if the principle of non-intervention has been redefined as a result of the responsibility to protect concept, it's been redefined for all parties who claim to be acting in the interests of the people of Syria. In other words, for Russia, Iran and Lebanese Hezbollah, as much as for Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the EU and the US. It's hard to see how this will lead to a more secure situation for the people of Syria. Indeed, it's arguably the continued militarisation of the situation in Syria that presents the most serious threat to the civilian population, as suggested by the report of the UN Commission of Inquiry, to which I've already referred. <coughs> 
The Commission has declared there that the desperation of the parties to the conflict has resulted in new levels of cruelty and brutality bolstered by an increase in the availability of weapons. Increased arms transfers hurt the prospect of a political settlement to the conflict, fuel the multiplication of armed actors at the national and regional levels and have devastating consequences for civilians. The report concluded it is urgent to de-escalate the conflict and curtail the flow of weapons to end the violence, to allow diplomacy to end the, the violence. Though I did see in the bathroom before I came over here, the student bathroom, a sign on the door advertising the UN model conference that said, the art of give, diplomacy is the art of giving people what you want. <laughs> so perhaps diplomacy isn't necessarily at the opposite of violence, however. Two final points to complete. Um, I've said a major question is uh, who decides, how do they decide? Here I think it's important to note that the World Summit outcome was carefully crafted not to require the Security Council or the P5 to take particular decisions uh, in situations of humanitarian crisis, but merely to give them a discretionary mandate uh, to, act, to, uh, to take decisions where they saw this as appropriate. And the US in particular was very clear that the World Summit outcome must not be couched as requiring states to, to take particular decisions in the council. Uh, the then um, US representative to the UN, John Bolton, who had been involved in Nicaragua, spelled out in a letter to member states that the charter has never been interpreted as creating a legal obligation for, secur for Security Council members to support enforcement action in specific cases and a determination as to what particular measures to adopt in specific cases cannot be predetermined in the abstract but must remain a decision within the purview of the Council. But to say that the Council has been given a discretionary mandate is not the end of the story. Thinking about the responsibility to protect as a form of law that has allocated discretionary power to an international executive raises questions about how that power should be exercised. And to date, the discretionary mandate to undertake executive action in order to further the goals of protecting civilians has been exercised in a selective fashion. It seems almost banal to make the point, uh, but I'll make it anyway, that the responsibility to protect concept is unlikely ever to be invoked uh, against a major ally of the P5, let alone one of the P5 themselves. But the concern with selectivity has been a re recurring theme in Security Council debates in relation to Libya and Syria, and more broadly in thematic debates about civilian protection since May 2011. And here I'll simply uh, refer to uh, James Crawford's inaugural lecture in this series uh, when he quote, quoted E.P. Thompson's description of the rule of law as an unqualified human good because it imposes at least some process constraints on the powerful. And James affirmed the need for the acceptance of the rule of law as a virtue at the international level, including the absence of arbitrary power as an important core value of the rule of law. James did caution that the application of the rule of law at the international level is conditioned by certain facts of life, among them the need for many decisions to be made by consensus if they're to be made at all. However, as he concluded, and as I would uh, strongly affirm, once international law be begins to concern itself with matters internal to the state, such as in this case, the protection of human rights and the management of civil war, international law must observe the standards it sets for national systems. As James said, it's no longer tenable to suggest that international law is substantially exempt from such standards or to espouse the view that the rule of law is a, virt a, virt a virtue for national systems which international law can enforce without having to comply with it itself. Finally, the responsibility to protect concept is significant because uh, it invests now a growing amount of power uh, to find facts, to give early warnings, to conduct surveillance, and to police states uh, in an international executive. But there's been less attention paid to the limits of that power. And we know that power justified in the name of security and protection has the tendency to become authoritarian. It may seem perverse of me to equate the benign intentions of the responsibility to protect concept with police states, uh, but there's been uh, 
a marked lack of discussion about the limits to international authority in this area. Now that discussion is beginning to emerge. Uh, we're beginning to see it, uh, for example, in the increasingly strong arguments put by Brazil, Russia, China, India and at South Africa since May 2011 in relation to uh, the Libyan intervention and particularly Brazil's uh, uh, release of a concept note in November 2011 called Responsibility While Protecting. Uh, Brazil had already raised these issues about the conduct of uh, protection actions in a May 2011 Security Council debate on the protection of civilians. And it there uh, commented on four issues that it saw as problems in relation to the conduct of the intervention in Libya. Regime change, prioritising peaceful and preventive means over militarisation, limits to the use of force and impartiality. They said, we must avoid excessively broad interpretations of the protection of civilians, which could link it to the exacerbation of conflict, compromise the impartiality of the United Nations, or create the perception that it's being used as a smokescreen for regime change. We must take the greatest care to ensure that our actions douse the flames of conflict instead of stoking them. When the Council does authorise the use of force, such as in the case of Libya, we must hold ourselves to a high standard. I'm here quoting Brazil and India's representative to the UN uh, put its concerns during the same Security Council debate on civilian protection in these terms, familiar to those of you who like the um, graphic novel The Watchmen. I cannot but ask the questions, quiz custodet ipsos custodes, who guards the guardians. There is a considerable sense of unease about the manner in which the humanitarian imperative of protecting civilians has been interpreted for actual action on the ground. The idea that the responsibility to protect concept must be seen to attach to all actors in a conflict, including external interveners, also emerges from the report of the Independent Commission of Inquiry on Syria in the report to which I've already referred. The commissioners there comment, there is a human cost to the increased availability of weapons, transfers of arms, heightens the risk of violations, leading to more civilian deaths and injuries. Accountability must be emphasised at all levels. And as Paolo Pinero, the chair of the commission, stated in a media briefing after meeting with the Security Council in June, what we say is that delivering arms engages the responsibility of those who deliver the arms because the people who will receive those arms could commit war crimes and gross human rights violations. It is very important to take this into account when arms are being delivered. So to conclude, according to UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, Human protection is a defining purpose of the United Nations in the 21st century and achieving it is a test of our common humanity. Much of the focus, critical and otherwise, in the debate over implementing the responsibility to protect concept has remained on the drama of military intervention, as in the case of Syria. There's been much less critical attention paid to the institutional questions involved in transforming the UN and civil society groups into agents of uh, human protection and the far more prosaic and everyday practices involved in the institutional work of surveillance, fact-finding, prevention, capacity building, security sector form and reform and administration. Nor has there been much attention paid to the subtle ways in which the language of protection has begun to authorise more expansive forms of intervention short of force, for example, in the apparent shift in the acceptability of providing logistical support, training and arms to rebel groups. Yet it's in these more routine and everyday decisions that the practical effects of the responsibility to protect concept will be determined and that international law has a key role to play. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Anne. What a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you. It's now my honour to uh, introduce um, Emily Crawford, um, who's going to provide a commentary uh, to um, Professor Orford's uh, presentation. By way of introduction, I, I make the observation that, in, in, in my experience, international <coughs> scholarship um, has two types of scholars. Those who are slow burn scholars, they publish, they keep chipping away, they develop a, a niche speciality, 
and they develop original thinking and, and arrive eventually at, at, their, at their destination. And then the, there are those who explode onto the scene, scene like wild Roman candles. It is my view that Emily is in that second category. Uh, she has exploded in a very short time onto the international scene, writing um, articles that make us all sit up and think. Uh, in my previous role in the Navy, um, I was Director of Operations in International Law. Um, I was involved in um, coordinating with the Americans a, a Pacific Command Conference uh, in, in the Gold Coast in 2011. And getting a spot on one of these things is, is, is a big deal. And I got a call from the Americans saying, uh, we have started reading the work of Emily Crawford. Is she as good as it, as it looks? And I said, yeah, she's the real deal. And sure enough, uh, she, she, got a, she, got a, she got a speaking part. Emily Crawford is a postdoctoral fellow and associate at the Sydney Centre for International Law. Previously at the Law Faculty of the University of New South Wales, Emily completed her Arts and Law degrees before working as a researcher at the Australian Broadcasting uh, Corporation, before returning to the University of New South Wales to undertake her PhD studies. Her doctoral thesis on the disparate treatment of participants in armed conflicts was published by Oxford University Press in 2010. Emily has taught international law and international humanitarian law and has delivered lectures both locally and overseas in international humanitarian law issues, including training of military personnel on behalf of the Red Cross in Australia. A member of the International Law Association's Committee on Non-State Actors, as well as the New South Wales Red Cross IHL Committee, Emily's current research project is looking at major developments in the conduct of armed conflicts in the 21st century such as cyber warfare and targeted assassinations and the implications for bo of both uh, for domestic and international law. ...and eminent scholars, Professor James Crawford and Professor Anne Orford. My father has been and continues to be unsurprisingly a major influence in my life, both personally and professionally. Professor Orford has also been a significant influence, though only on my professional life. Uh, however, if the professor wants to take me aside after the lecture, remind me that my curfew is midnight and that I shouldn't talk to strange men, uh, well, I'll consider the circle to be complete. <laughs> I would like to thank Professor Orford for her sophisticated and, and nuanced uh, arrangement this evening, uh, taking us through the history and development of the concept of responsibility to protect and how it's evolved to date. Uh, the idea of responsibility to protect is actually only about as old as my own law career. Uh, it emerged about the same time as I started my law studies in New South Wales. Uh, back then, from the lofty position of six months of law school under my belt, I was profoundly sceptical of the idea of responsibility to protect. The 9-11 attacks had just taken place, and I really didn't see much of a future for the concept. I didn't doubt the merits or the underlying philosophy behind responsibility to protect. I just didn't think it would ever gain any traction on the international plane. Fast forward 12 years, and I now teach responsibility to protect to master's students as part of my Law of Armed Conflict course, which in itself is something of a statement regarding how responsibility to protect has come to be perceived by many. Responsibility to protect has become a part of the international legal discourse, but often, as Professor Orford has pointed out tonight, that discourse has been limited to the most extreme parts of the responsibility to protect concept, that of military intervention. Indeed, it is this preoccupation with the military aspects of responsibility to protect, or R2P as the kids are calling it nowadays, that has actually threatened to derail the normative force that R2P has generated over the last decade. Uh, the employment of the responsibility to protect concept in the debate and action against Libya is a case in point. Many people look to Libya as essentially the test case for demonstrating how responsibility to protect could be operationalised but the military overreach that occurred in that instance threatened to undermine any potential normative force that responsibility to protect has been generating. Indeed, at a recent speech in Sydney, Ralph Zacklin, the former Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs of the United Nations, stated that it was his opinion that the intervention in Libya tarnished every single one of the principles invoked by responsibility to protect and played into concerns held by many states that responsibility to protect is neo-colonialism in disguise. It has been this focus on the potential military facet of responsibility to protect that Professor Orford critiques in her work. Uh, 
as she has noted tonight, the common origins to both R2P and to authoritarian rule and power uh, come together and she makes the argument that this shared origin can account for why the more invasive elements of responsibility to protect uh, has dominated discourse. And I quote, grounding authority on the capacity to protect has historically tended to privilege certain kinds of institutions and certain forms of actions over others. The turn to protection focuses upon creating institutions that privilege coherence, control and centralisation. In that respect, authority justified in terms of its capacity to guarantee protection has historically had a tendency to become authoritarian. As Professor Orford has illustrated tonight, this radicalisation of authority and the resulting militarisation of civil life that accompanies it has meant that, and I quote, much attention is currently being paid to building the international capacity to respond to protection challenges through developing more efficient and integrated forms of surveillance and policing mechanisms. But there has been much less discussion of the legal limits to international action undertaken to guarantee protection. Indeed, this focus on the, the intervention side of policing on, on military facets of R2P and some of the discourse has really distracted from what Professor Orford notes is the real normative force and power inherent in R2P, the actual rejection of unilateral humanitarian intervention in favour of a normative structure that guides international responses short of military intervention in order to protect civilian life. Uh, Professor Orford also departs from the other dominant academic position on responsibility to protect and one that I flagged at the beginning of my comments, that of the insignificance of the idea of responsibility to protect. The dominant approach seems to dismiss responsibility to protect uh, as being introduced as a new concept in national discourse and as the Professor notes in her book International Authority and the Responsibility to Protect, quote, for some critics, the indeterminate content and uncertain status of the responsibility to protect concept seem to be, have been left deliberately vague, suggesting that states have no intention of taking on new obligations to protect suffering peoples in foreign lands. From this perspective, the invocation of the responsibility to protect concept is at best an empty rhetorical gesture, cynically made by leaders of Western states to assuage the growing popular pressure for action in situations of humanitarian crisis. At worst, the ambiguity and contingency of the responsibility to protect concept will mean that it can serve as a front for business as usual on the part of powerful states. Any unilateral military action can potentially be justified as necessary to protect populations at risk." End quote. However, Professor Orford essentially argues that both these approaches miss the point of the concept of responsibility to protect and miss the importance and significance of it. That responsibility to protect is, quote, not a form of law that imposes duties on subjects. Rather, it can best be understood as a form of law that confers powers of a public or official nature and that allocates jurisdiction. The responsibility to protect concept should be understood as normative in the sense of providing legal authorization for certain kinds of activities." End quote. As such, Professor Orford has gone against the dominant academic narrative around responsibility to protect, which has often painted the concept as a neo-colonialist mechanism whereby powerful states can claim the role of humanitarian protector in order to intervene unilaterally in order to affect regime change. Rather, Professor Orford rightly points out that there has been far less critical attention paid to the possibility that responsibility to protect can be used precisely as its proponents suggest it should be used, to expand international executive rule in the name of protecting life. This idea of the linkage of protection and authority brings additional complications for R2P, namely, as Professor Orford has noted tonight, who decides whether an authority is functioning effectively? Who decides what protection means in a particular time and place? The post-Kosovo era has left open the question of which body representing the universal or the international community has the authority to determine the lawfulness of rulers. The question of who has the authority to decide the meaning of peace and protection has been reopened but not resolved by the responsibility to protect concept." End quote. And this is especially pertinent when we look at the ongoing situation in Syria, where the debate seems to resolve as much around, sorry, revolve as much around who has the authority to act as it does whether we should act at all. The responsibility to protect concept, as it has somewhat been hijacked, certainly carries a significant rhetorical and emotional force 
For decades, we have witnessed the Holocaust, Cambodia, Rwanda, Srebrenica. After every event, we say never again, and yet it seemed an empty promise. <coughs> Then UN Secretary Kofi Annan said to the General Assembly following the Kosovo intervention, quote, if humanitarian intervention is indeed an unacceptable assault on sovereignty, how should we respond to a Rwanda, to a Srebrenica, to gross and systematic violations of human rights that affect every precept of our common humanity? As Professor Orford has noted tonight, it was this challenge that spurred the development of the concept of responsibility to protect a concept designed not as a rhetorical tool for powerful states to act unilaterally under the cloak of protector, but as a detailed set of norms for the entire UN community to follow, to act to prevent conflict, to respond to conflict, and to react after conflict, but in line with and utilising UN standards, processes, tools, and practices as vested in the UN executive. In the face of what's happening in Syria, it's easy to be cynical about responsibility to protect. However, when the concept is correctly conceptualised, as Professor Orford puts it, as a holistic and integrated idea, rather than as an excuse for military action and regime change, responsibility to protect truly offers the hope that never again has some normative force and is not just a rhetorical gimmick. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those were two very timely and poignant uh, lecture and response uh, uh, to us. Uh, we now come to a time of question time. Uh, before we will have a chance for three questions, uh, two from here in Adelaide and, and I should say one from KL. And this is a, a very good time. Every year the law school uh, happily, and I can see, I can't see him, but I can feel the presence of, <laughs> I can feel the presence of Associate Professor Chris Symes. Every year we welcome uh, our alumni from around the world. Hold on, Chris. A and we're very pleased to be able to welcome our alumni from Malaysia. Uh, we have about 140 students and our, by far our largest group is from Malaysia. Now, Chris, before we have our questions, I thought you might just do a quick introduction of our friends up there. So, hey, that is good, eh? Oh. <laughs> This afternoon, a uh, meeting at uh, uh, offices, Spill of Advocates, and uh, Thomas Spill uh, is uh, an advocate alumni, and uh, so uh, here in the, um, the library meeting room, um, he imports uh, junior solicitor from, from Late Law School. Alumni, and he is, even has an intern from um, the Late Book School. Um, so, uh, but he, he is an inclusive person, and so uh, we have uh, not just Adelaide alumni here, but we also have uh, alumni from many other uh, universities around the world, um, all work lawyers. We've been joined by about over 40 uh, both junior and senior lawyers, um, and uh, they've been an attentive audience, I can report. <coughs> And, and uh, the technology has clearly worked, and um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've clearly watched and heard uh, Professor Orr and Dr. Crawford. Uh, back to you, uh, Ms. Williams. Thank you very much. We, uh, you probably didn't see it, but Matthew has had his fingers crossed through the whole event that, this, <laughs> that the technology may work. So we now have time for three questions. Uh, we'll start here. Is there a question here? And we have some roaming mics, I think, with colleagues. Well, this is the roaming mic. <laughs> I'll probably ask our two presenters to come forward. Do we have a question? Yes. small, the larger the greater kind of intervention 
and now somehow have become legal and that obviously needs to be a fundamental change and a fundamental problem? So I'm saying two things and they're both captured in your comment. So one is that I think um, the responsibility to protect concept within the UN is working as, has been operationalised quite systematically as a means to, uh, in, to, to create an integrated, coherent system of protection throughout UN agencies, organised around these measures short of intervention, but including the authorisation of force through the Security Council, but mechanisms of early warning, of fact-finding, uh, of weapons inspection, of quiet diplomacy, uh, and uh, creating a f uh, coherent account of authority to um, conduct those practices and to conceptualise their, their meaning uh, and then to provide um, an account of the way in which those practices should be integrated. But um, in the context of Syria, we're seeing something that I hadn't anticipated, but I think ha bears some relation to this um, notion of the responsibility to protect and that is precisely the second aspect of your question yes i think that something unexpected is happening in relation to the way in which um, these other forms of intervention are being seen as legal so i was interested to see this week that the british parliament is now um, resisting the idea of arming rebels <clears throat> But we haven't really seen that kind of response happening elsewhere and there's been very little legal discussion of the legality of that or there may have been but I have missed it. Um, so we're certainly not seeing the kind of legal discussion about arming rebels for instance that we're seeing around um, unilateral uh, bombing and I'm interested in that. Now whether that's because of the responsibility to protect concept I can't say definitively because no one's been called upon to explain the legality of the arming of rebels. But I'm interested in the fact that we seem now to just, have, uh, to just be seeing that as unproblematically uh, legal. And the reason I bring up Nicaragua, Nicaragua is to make that a little bit starker. Look at this difference. How do we make sense of it? I'm not going to let you get away with it for nothing. Now we'll go to our, we'll come in KL. <laughs> yeah. Tiruma Kase, uh, that means thank you, John. Um, I have um, uh, Yvonne, uh, a, a junior solicitor here, uh, to ask a question. The idea of responsibility to protect, um, because it involves, and you mentioned that it wouldn't be simple, because it involves radicalization of authority and as well as reallocation of power. So, where and how do you see acts of resistance and challenge happen in this context? Thank you. Do you mean acts of resistance to uh, acts of resistance in what new, sense? Uh, resistance to this new concept of responsibility to protect. So one of the things that I think is very interesting um, in the way the concept has been developed is the attempt, particularly I think, by uh, Professor Ed Luck when he was the special rapporteur on responsibility to protect, to move very slowly. Uh, with the concept so as to bring um, states in particular with him. So while we'd seen a lot of resistance at the level of governments to the notion of um, humanitarian intervention, we saw much less resistance at the level of governments to the notion of responsibility to protect. Uh, where we see a, a pushback against the concept, I think, has been in the aftermath of the Libyan intervention, and that's been around the, the sense that both um, NATO took advantage of its mandate to use the responsibility to protect as a smokescreen for something else that it sought polit geopolitically in the region, uh, and also in the idea that's now being put by Brazil that we've seen the UN moving away from its commitment to impartiality uh, and indeed the Secretary General has taken that point up, interestingly, in relation to early warning and fact-finding. So the Secretary General has now said we have to be very careful 
that the processes of fact-finding aren't being used um, as a smokescreen for um, war propaganda, in effect. He doesn't quite say it like that. Um, and I think we're now seeing, seeing that play out very strongly with um, the UN, I think, right in a very concerted way, trying to stop states um, intervening militarily in Syria. Um, in terms of resistance below the state or apart from the state, one of the things that's very interesting about the concept is the way that it radicalises authority within a state, within the territory of a state. And that is a really another whole question we could talk, have talked about for the um, time of this lecture. How doctrines relating to recognition, for example, I think, are being um, shaped by this concept, by the practices around respons responsibility to protect, particularly in the Middle East over the past two years. No, I just, I just building on what uh, Professor Orford has said, I think that um, the drafters of, of the concept and the way it's been kind of forwarded in the international sphere has really attempted to reaffirm the centrality of the UN in all of this and the idea that it's about collective, a collective response rather than a, you know, unilateral action and about reaffirming the idea that it is con it's a consensus building process. So I think that was done in, in, very carefully in order to head off any concerns that unfortunately what then happened in Libya was actually uh, the way responsibility pr to protect was going to play out, that it was basically regime change by another name. Thank you. Is there one last question here in Adelaide? Adelaide speaking. Hello, Ruth Russell from WILF, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. A few years ago I heard a very good model which I thought protected citizens and it was in South America. I can't remember what country, but what they did was they just declared an area safe, they just cleared all the guns out and they had vol international volunteers who would just be told if anyone was coming along and then they would call the police and they'd be disarmed. And it seemed to me a very simple one. They didn't affect the lives of the people at the time, they just kept there, but they were safe within that area. And it just seemed to me that that was the sensible way to go about this. Why can't they just declare an area safe in an area and just say, right, there are no guns in here, all cleared out, no one can bring guns in, and let the people live their normal lives. Why do we have to go to a military option? It just seems so counterproductive. Why can't, has people talked about this model? It was so simple and cheap, they were even volunteers doing it. A 17-year-old girl from Adelaide was there for six months as a volunteer. It does sound like a, it sounds like a wonderful ideal. Um, so, uh, if that is if that is fully if there's a full commitment to the creation of that kind of safe space, uh, it could indeed be um, a very productive way to go. The very significant problem that that kind of strategy has produced, um, I think we've seen discussed in the press the last couple of weeks in relation to Srebrenica. So during that period of the war, during the breakup of Yugoslavia, one strategy that peacekeepers were using was to create safe havens, as they were called during that um, time. <clears throat> we saw also the same attempt in Rwanda. But um, in each case, either in the case of Rwanda, a lack of commitment to provide resources, or in the case of Srebrenica, uh, an interpretation of the rules of engagement meant that um, those spaces in which people had gathered to be safe, in <laughs> fact, became quite the opposite. They became places where people were gathered together and slaughtered. So in each of those instances, the strategy of creating a safe space that wasn't kept safe led, in fact, to genocide. So I think the real problem with that kind of spatial conception is that it requires an extremely strong and resolute commitment to protecting the safety of a space that you've de declared to be safe. And we... <laughs> no. So metaphorically, you could say, that would be an ambition in Syria, at least not to keep sending so many weapons in, even if you can't take them out at least stop sending weapons into, those, into that situation. 
And certainly that is a strategy that the Security Council has attempted in a number of uh, civil war situations now, is to create an arms embargo and at least um, try and stop arms flooding in uh, in the situation of a civil war. But I can see very much the appeal of the, uh, the proposition. Yeah, and I'd just like to, to build on that a little bit. It, it is uh, an, an idea that's fundamental in IHL, the idea of neutral zones and, and safe zones in certain areas that are not to be targeted, uh, even if they are um, housing people who once participated in the armed conflict, so, you know, the wounded and sick soldiers and things like that. The problem is that for the last 100 years or so, they have been targets simply because it's easier to hit people who can't defend themselves. And as much as it would be nice to think that both sides are going to make this noble commitment not to target the vulnerable, I think certainly in a situation such as Syria or, or in a civil war, if you can crush the opposition by killing their family, uh, it is an easier and quicker way than just making this kind of Marcus of Queen Queensbury um, commitment to only target people who happen to be carrying a weapon. Uh, and I, I think that much as the idea is, is wonderful, I think it would actually require a, a radical change in human nature rather than just the law. Thank you very much for our questioners and thank you very much for the answers. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Warren Birmingham, to move a vote of thanks to our two speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Williams. And can I just uh, add to the Dean's opening remarks my own pleasure at having James Crawford here. It's great to meet so distinguished a graduate and former staff member of the faculty. Um, I first spent time in Syria in the mid-1990s on a sabbatical when I was there as a musicologist uh, pursuing survivals of the music of the Crusades, uh, in which uh, Syria is very, very rich, having some of the most perfectly uh, preserved crusading castles and, and um, survivals in the region. Um, <clears throat> and I came uh, to meet many Syrians and, uh, and learn what a wonderfully warm and friendly people they are, and also uh, how immeasurably generous uh, they are. Um, it's a country of small villages, it's a country of little farming communities. Um, it's a very, very peaceful place and for anyone who knows Syria to see itself, uh, to see the country tearing itself apart um, as is now happening is, is enormously upsetting um, and actually quite difficult to imagine really given the nature of the people themselves. So the reflections tonight um, by Professor Orford <coughs> and the younger Crawford um, have been great to hear and as an uh, issue of what to do um, <coughs> for us to reflect on the nature of humanitarian uh, intervention um, uh, is I think a very useful thing for us to have spent time on this evening and hugely topical. So Professor Orford, thank you so much for that very erudite lecture and equally for the commentary that followed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vice Chancellor. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it re only remains for me to say a few thank yous on behalf of the Law School. Firstly, I'd like to thank you, James, for attending this lecture. It's a great privilege to have you back amongst us. I'd also like to thank our speakers uh, and the Vice-Chancellor for his attendance here tonight. Putting these events together is never easy and it requires numerous colleagues. Uh, key to that group is the International Law Scholars at the Law School. These are a dynamic group uh, whose plans appear to have no boundaries <laughs> and, his, and their ambition to take over the law school is palpable. <laughs> Inspired by our history, uh, it's been a great privilege of mine to assist in making compulsory international law for all our students. Uh, I, think the, I think the future is in capable hands.
So thank you to Associate Professor Dale Stevens, Dr. Rebecca LaForgia and Dr. Matthew Stubbs. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank, in their absence, Maura Groves and Sheena uh, Bevins, who are tireless work in this. I'd also additionally like to thank our students who came as both ushers, guides and attendees. I'd like to make a special mention to our friends uh, and alumni in KL, and if I could just ask Chris to say uh, good evening from us from KL. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, so just to say thank you to uh, Matthew uh, Thomas Phillip uh, and uh, all the attendees here in KL, uh, both uh, our alumni and uh, and others, um, they uh, perhaps they should be thanking us because uh, each of them have received a one CPD point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> listening to, to uh, uh, Professor Alford tonight. <laughs> Salamat Pingal, John. That good evening. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you to our friends in KL very much.